there are some more of these back there in the back if you'd like to pick one up. Because I'm not gonna do the I'm not gonna do the whole thing. Do continue to remember William and Pat Carmack in your prayers. He came home today um, under hospice care. So um, she I talked to her last night and she's um, she's very distraught. So um, right now, maybe no visitors are called. They were supposed to have gotten home at 2 o'clock today. I haven't heard anything else from her today, but I do continue to remember them in the prayers and um, just pray for them to have some, some peace and, and comfort uh, in these last, last days. It was, um, she's pretty upset. Uh, another is update um, that uh, Jane just gave me here. Catherine Gibson, who's in our bulletin here, um, she she passed away, so that's incorrect in the um, in the bulletin. She did pass away. Uh, Jim, of course, is still in here needing prayers. Uh, Rule gross. This was something that you probably didn't know if you didn't pick one of these up. Fell Monday night. Uh, cut his head real bad. Has five stitches above his eyebrow. Um, keep him in your prayers as well. Uh, what else we got here? Men's breakfast Saturday morning. Uh, 8 to, uh, to 9.30. Man, if you hadn't got a call, you can. You just need to show up anyway. So that's uh, Saturday morning at 8 o'clock back here in the Fellowship Hall. All our young'uns got back safe from the mountains. Um, vacation Bible School, mark your calendars, June the 12th through the 15th. Anybody have anything that's not in the bulletin that maybe we need to bring everybody up to speed on? Something that's happened maybe since Sunday and now. Uh, Mike, will you lead us in a prayer? Holy Father, we are so thankful for every opportunity that we have to come together as your people, to study your word, to come to you in songs of praise, to just fellowship with one another and show our love for one another. Father, we as we hear these announcements, we know that there are many Bless them with wisdom and discernment and the vision of what treatments are best. We pray, Father, that you bless their bodies to respond well to the treatments that they receive. Father, we know that if we pray for healing for these, and we're going to mention some names here, that, that healing can occur in this world and that all healing comes from you. You're the source of every good and perfect gift. Father, that you answer every prayer that we bring before you through Jesus, and that many times healing occurs in the world to come, and that healing is good and perfect. So, Father, we pray uh, especially now for William Carmack, what appears to be at the end of his life, that you bless him that his days can be as pain free as possible. And if you bless he and Pat with the peace that you promised that passes all understanding and that you guard his heart and hers and their mind in Jesus as he promised. We pray, Father, that he will not have to suffer long as he suffers and that you will bless him with your mercy by sending your ministering angels to gently escort him home presence of Jesus. Father, we pray for rural growth. We know that Brother Gross has had a lot of trouble this year and even last year. We just pray that you'll be merciful to him and bless him that he can gain some strength and some agility that he might be prevented from further fall. That you bless his memory that it might improve and that you give Judy strength to just, just be merciful. Father, we are mindful of David Hemantoller and his niece, Mike Glenn, Alfred Driver. We're thankful for his successful knee replacement surgery. We pray.
pray for Andy Ward, uh, that you'll be the mercy to him and bless him, for John Weber, for Captain Gibson. We pray for Brother Jim Fuller. It always does our heart good to see him here and be so kind and love fellowship and worship. And we just pray, Father, that you'll bless him so he'll be able to come back soon. We pray for Diane Johnson. There's a long list of others, Father. We just pray your blessing be upon them. Father, you know what they need better than we know what to ask. And we just pray that you will extend to them the healing that they desire. Father, we're thankful for the trip that our young people were able to make this last weekend. We're grateful for your blessing of being with them. We pray that they'll grow in their love for Jesus, recognize that even though the deceiver would have them doubt his presence and his power, that this universe and all universes that have been created were created through him, for him, and that we belong to him, and that because we belong to him, that he's always with us and he protects us, even when we walk through our own valley of the shadow of death. Bless us that we would not fear evil, but trust in him, especially be with our young guard their hearts. Father, lead them not into temptation, but deliver them from the evil one. We pray, Brooke, that you'll bless Brother Lee this evening as he brings a lesson. That you'll bless him to have a good and, and a fervent remembrance of the things he's prepared, and that you'll bless our hearts to receive it so that your word may take fruit and take, uh, take hold in our lives and bear much fruit. We pray for Chris so that he directs our singing, that we sing from the heart. Father, we pray that uh, every teacher that's prepared a lesson tonight, that you'll bless them and bless the school. Father, be with us throughout the rest of our lives. We pray when it's time for us to leave this old world, that you'll see us through the blood of Jesus and bring us home to you wherever that is. We just thank you. Amen. Amen. Before Chris gets up here, one other thing. Uh, Jack Usry, if you notice, there's two five-gallon buckets out there as you walk through the door. There are AAA batteries and AA batteries. Clean him out. I told him I wish I had those around Christmas time. Every toy Tucker got ran on double A AA or triple A batteries. So anyway.
more people came in. There's a passage we're going to look at a little bit more in class tonight, but I'm going to share it as part of our devotional this evening. It's 2 Corinthians chapter 12. It's the Corinthians, the, Corinth, the church at Corinth were kind of like Paul's problem children. And we have two letters. We have, we have first and second Corinthians. Actually, uh, if my memory serves me correct, what we have is, is first Corinthians actually wasn't the first letter, nor was third Corinthians. Uh, Second Corinthians, that there were probably four letters written back and forth. We know by history that Titus hand carried one to him, so kind of like what we have is first and second. That's not all that he said. So he really, the, these people give him, he loved them um, like his own children. He went so far as to say that. But there's something that he says here that all parents here should be able to identify with as far as the relationship between, between parents and children. I'm going to read. Um, and this is uh, verse 14 of 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Now I'm ready to visit you for the third time, and I will not be a burden to you, because what I want is not uh, your possessions, but you. After all, children should not have to save up for their parents, but the parents for their children. So I will very gladly spend for you everything, and I have, and I have expend myself as well. And then this, this is something that he says here, if you're listening closely. And he says it kind of tongue-in-cheek. If I love you more, will you love me less? There's a truism there, whether Paul's saying that tongue-in-cheek or not. But I, I think about myself, and I've been on both sides of this. The people that love you the most tend to be the ones that you take for granted, and at least on the outside, you love less. It's pretty true, isn't it? I don't know who, who coined the, the, the phrase. It's an old adage that familiarity breeds contempt, and that's true. But what Paul is saying here, every parent in here should be able to identify with. You know, you, and and, and he's, remember, he's writing to the Corinthians because he considered them his, his children. Um, he loved them so much, but it appeared like they didn't love him so much. The more he loved them, the less they, the, they returned the love. It's a hurtful thing. You know, when Paul was, was writing these letters, he had to be hurt. One of the things that, that came to my mind when I read Paul's little short sentence here was two cases, one Old Testament, one in New. The children of Israel, of, of all the people that have ever walked the face of the planet, that God showered blessing after blessing after blessing and just poured out his heart and soul and, and worked, worked so patiently. Of all the people you can think of that didn't appreciate God, and even his son when he came, it was them. And I think about when Paul said this, I, they, that comes to my mind. And then I think about Jesus standing on a hill looking at Jerusalem and, and even using the metaphor that if he was, if I would have gathered you together like a hen gathers his, you know, her chicks under wing, but, but you wouldn't do it. So when I read passages like this, and I think when Paul was writing this, he might have had a tear in his eye. But the lesson tonight is this. May we never, here at Berea, take each other for granted. Amen? No, don't do that. Don't, if somebody expresses their love for you, don't love them less. Don't do that. Because it breaks their heart and breaks God's heart. So wherever you are tonight, and if you've got people in your lives, tonight, tomorrow, and as you're going through the week, when I, I got this lesson together, there were some things I did um, and, and will continue to do to try to correct some of my behavior. Try to make sure that the people that are showering their love on you, appreciate them. Uh, don't love them less, that, and especially in the, in the Lord's church. So whatever you need tonight, come now as together we stand and sing.
Oh, I'm gonna get me some of those too, dude. Like I said Tucker, he runs through he runs through those. Oh. Every, they don't make they don't make a toy anymore that, that doesn't run on the battery. I don't they hardly make any toys anymore that don't have to have a battery. Yeah. Where where you got them? I'll ask him now. I still had toys that actually the key you could remove and put in there. That little robot, my little old robot that had the sparky eyes on it. There's no telling what he'd be worth now. You, know, you wound him up and there was like a, a little friction thing in there and he, his eyes would spark. It was tin, it was like a press tin toy. Yeah. Of course I had a lot of those little like pressed metal toys. Like I had a lot of the little pressed metal toys that either wound up or you could Drag them and roll them. You know, there were I had a lot of those. Hey, brother. Jack, I'm still waiting for you to bring my my, uh, my truck and tractor. I need uh, I need one seven like 750 cranking amps. So others a little bit. I don't know what the tractor is, but I'll get back to you on that. If you just bring me some of the. <laughs> <laughs> Where'd you get all the batteries? This FedEx? Really? Wow. Yeah. Well. Yeah. Yeah, Jason. I'm glad. You, I, like I said, I'm. I'm tickled to have them. We run through. I go to Harbor Freight and buy batteries probably once a month for for his stuff. Everything he's got. Of course, he leaves it on. You know. You'd be laying in the bed in the middle of the night and you hear this, ar, 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 what is that? <laughs> you know, and you go through the house looking, you know, or, you know, it's, it has this one car, it's a, it's a police car, and he'll never turn that thing off. And just in the middle of the night, it'll start going, <laughs> Cindy woke up one night, she says, is the sheriff here? <laughs> so I got to go find that car and turn it off. So that car, it's not in the house anymore. That that police cruiser's been disabled. He has got fire trucks and no Matthew. Matthew got his drum set. Oh, so you don't? Yeah, yeah. He's been look. He has looked for his drum set. Don't want to lie to a five-year-old, but he comes ask. Well, you know, he comes ask. You know where my drum? You know where my drum set is? And go ask Nini. <laughs> it's a lie, trombone. 
I tell you what, when y'all knuckleheads, y'all buy him something like that, man, you're going to have us a gospel meeting. <laughs> I don't need, ooh. I'm going to, just got a few high points I want to hit tonight. We're closing in on the end of this. If we don't get through tonight, we will next week for sure. I want to read uh, actually verses 11 through 13. It's pretty much Paul more of the same. You know, Paul every now and then, I, he, he kind of beats a dead horse, but I think hmm, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it's going to start with verse 11. But you've got to remember, he's trying to get these people to straighten up. And if any of you have had children, um, and Paul sees these folks as his children, sometimes you just got to keep beating a dead horse. I mean, it, it's there's, they're just, there has to be continual reinforcement of something over and over again. And they may not like it, um, but I can think of some of the things. Of course, I was a pretty slow learner. So some of the things that mom and dad would tell me, and apparently I just didn't get it because they would tell me, and then they would tell me with their mouth first, and then they would tell me with their hand and other items that would be laying around just to try to get me to understand. So some of the things that Paul says here over and over again, there's a reason for it. I have made a fool of myself, but you drove me to it. How many parents can relate to that? <laughs> Tucker, come in this afternoon, ring tail tutor. I'm like, dude, you just got here. I don't want to go round and round with you. No, don't drive me to it. Uh, so I can, I, can, I can see this. I ought to have been commended by you, for I'm not the least inferior, and he uses the term super apostles again, even though I'm nothing. The things that mark an apostle, signs, wonders, and miracles, were done among you great, with great perseverance. Paul again saying, hey, all these things were done. These guys are coming sashaying in here now, saying there's something. You saw all of this from me. How you were inferior? How were you inferior to other churches, except that I was never a burden to you? Forgive me this wrong. Paul, and more, on more than one occasion, was pretty proud of the fact that he didn't, he, he supported himself. He's not saying that that's something that everybody had to do, but he was pretty proud of it. Paul had a trade, he practiced trade, and you think about this, and this is, really has nothing to do with the lesson, but it does have, it is kind of a statement about our society today. Was Paul a very um, well-educated man? Very much so. Uh, very and here, listen, y'all, not just in, in, um, with, with the Jewish tradition. Paul was a well-educated man, even, even with the Greeks and the Romans. But did Paul have a trade? Yeah, he did. How did he support himself? Did he support himself with his education, or did he support himself with his tent making? The, the point is this. You know, a lot of times in our society today, a lot of folks get high and mighty, and they feel like they've educated themselves to the point that they can no longer work with their hands, they're making a serious, serious blunder. Uh, there are, there's a great deal to be gained by that. Uh, Dad, uh, when he was um, with TVA the last few years, they had um, German engineer, uh, engineering students would come over here um, with the power construction um, crews the ones that were going to be electrical engineers that were going to specify in power distribution and stuff, and they had to come over here. They had already, now check this out now, they had already finished their, their school. They already, as far as their college part goes. Then they had to do four years in whatever area they were going to be in engineering. And so he had to do a four-year apprenticeship before he could get his engineering degree uh, from, the, from the university he attended in Germany. How's that sound? Now, Say what you want. What kind of engineers do you think Germany turns out? They're, they're, yeah, they're, they're, they're pretty good. They're, yeah, they're pretty smart. Not, not just with cars, but they're pretty smart. So, again, Paul, just a side note, Paul supported himself, and he was proud of that. Wasn't a burden. Now, I'm ready to visit you for the third time, three times, and I will not be a burden to you because I read this earlier, because I want, what I want is not your possessions, but you. It's almost like some of them had even been accusing Paul of trying to take some stuff. I mean, it's obvious he wasn't. I mean, he didn't take anything from the first time. These guys, whoever these super apostles were, they were just smearing Paul in any possible way they could possible smear him. You know, he's out to get you money, and he's not all that, and he can't talk. You need to, just over. They, they must have really just been dragging him. Yeah, Mike. It's interesting he uses these terms, such as uh, these letters of derision. He gets into this. False teachers, false prophets. And he specifically says, 
what they're aiming at is their careful condition and breeding. Yeah. So these people that are doing what he's saying he did to them. And they're hoping they're going to speak for profit because they're asking for their money and they're taking their money. And somehow that may have been somebody to listen to. And basically, and this happens in the world today. Uh, yeah. If you make it too easy for somebody, they will not appreciate it and they'll take no effect. Well, I think that's why Paul says, I, I, I loved you more, you're going to love me less. I don't know why people are like that, but you're exactly right. I've seen that to be true, too. It's funny, I think what hurts Paul's feelings the most is, these people were coming in as con men or, or whatever you want to call them, and were misusing these people, and they loved them for it. So, they were obviously good at it, and uh, but it had to hurt Paul's feelings, you know, I... I love you. You love me less. These people are taking advantage of you, and, and you're showering them with, with all your affection. It, that, that hurts. Have you all ever had somebody do that to you, that you love, and somebody wades into their life, and they believe everything they say, and they go, how does that make you feel? This is those what Paul's talking about here. It's not funny, but everybody here, <laughs> is like, yeah, okay. If, if you haven't been down that road, well, bless your heart, because you're due. You're due. It's coming. Uh, if you haven't been down that road, because... Because I have. Yeah, Kevin. Well, when you look at uh, Ray Stewart, he, he was spiritual. Because they had no idea how much he loved them. Now, all that he's doing is expressing that love. But there was some point in their life, especially when they start getting older, that, that question is due. If you did not mature more, possessing more of a, of a energy and a love or time or money to do, it's a day. You can just be special sometimes. Love me less. You love me less. I don't have an explanation for it. What Paul is saying here when I read it, and I've read it before, but it, I've said before, depending on what particular time you are in your life, you can read the same passage again. I even had this underlined. I read it again. I'm like, hmm. And I thought about it some more. Because the people in our lives, and, it, and, and listen, don't be one of these people because I've been on both sides of this. Don't be the person that's taking advantage and, and, and not appreciate. Don't be that person um, because you, you, you should know how it feels. Everybody here tonight is an adult. You know how it feels, whether it's your children or your husband or your wife or a co-worker, or whoever it is. Uh, uh, you do right by people and you, and you love them. And, of course, the classic example, Paul has an example here, but the classic example is, is Jesus himself. I have often in, in my mind envisioned him standing there just, just boo-hooing over Israel, it just, just broke his heart. He just wanted them, and then, but he's like, but you wouldn't. You just wouldn't do it. And, and at that point in time, what do you do then? And Paul is just about this point of desperation too. If, they would, if Jesus said, but you would not, then what do you do? What's left? That's a tough, that's a tough pill to swallow. If they're just, they're just so stiff-necked or that they're going to keep going their own way, you just got to let them go and pray that maybe they'll come back. But there's nothing you can do to hold them. There's nothing you can do about it. So it's a hard thing to see people do that. He does, he does say, um, let me read, read this again. Now I'm ready to visit you. For the After all, children should not save up for their parents, but parents for their children. I'm going down that road right now with mine. We, we, I don't know, Mom, I don't know if she can see this tonight, but if she does, we, Mom, we've already talked about this. They, um, you know, they. <laughs> we think it might be better for them to have a different living arrangement, which would, would cost money, which they have. In their mind, though, no. And the, the one thing they bring up every time is, is this is, we don't want to spend this money because this is money that we've saved up for you kids. And it doesn't make any difference because I don't want your money. It doesn't matter. That doesn't matter. 
because in their mind, that's something that, that parents are supposed to do. That's just the way it is. That's the way they were raised, and it's a thing that you pass on, down, and that's just the way it is. It didn't make any difference. I quit talking about it. So Paul says the same thing here, and that is something I guess that's, I guess that's been around since the beginning of time, um, wanting um, to take care of your kids and leaving something for them that they can build on. Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean that's going to happen. I've also seen that go the wrong way too. You can leave all you want to, but it's kind of like the casting your pearl before swine sometimes too. They might just take your inheritance and be like a prodigal son and off it goes. But anyway, he does say that. So I very gladly will spend for spend everything. I have expend myself, expended myself as well. I can imagine. If, if I love you more, will you love me less? I got that highlighted in my Bible. We won't talk about it anymore. But that, be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you, yet here he is being sarcastic again, yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent you? Titus, sent, sent, Titus probably delivered one of the letters, or did. Uh, I urged Titus to go to you, and I sent our brother with him. Did Titus, did Titus did not exploit, exploit you, did he? Uh, did we not act in the same spirit and follow the same course? Again, Paul's just trying to draw the contrast here. Why do you keep buying into these super apostles, whether it was me or whether it was Titus or anybody else we sent to you? We didn't behave like that. Why are you buying into this? Had to be hurtful. And he's going to, where I want us to spend most of our time tonight. Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ, and everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I'm afraid that when I, this is serious here, for I'm afraid that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. That sounds almost like a parent, uh, when I get home, whatever I told you to do this morning better be done. Because if I find that you haven't, you've disappointed me, you're really going to be disappointed in what I've got and what you've got coming. So that's basically what Paul is saying here. Um, I fear that there may be quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, faction, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. First of all, do you think Paul already knew that was the case? Yeah, he, he wouldn't have even been writing the letter. He's trying to give him one more chance here to tune up. I'm afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented from the impurity, impurity sexual sin, debauchery in which they have indulged. I, I used a James 3.16 in Sunday's lesson because some of the things he mentions here go hand in hand with what uh, Jesus' brother said about uh, envy and selfish ambition. If you've got envy and selfish ambition... You have disorder and every evil practice. By the very context of Paul's letters right here to the Corinthians, do you think selfish ambition was a problem? What do you think drove the super apostles? And probably monetary gain too, but definitely power, selfish ambition. So whether it's James or Paul here, these things that he itemizes here they existed because there was envy and there was selfish ambition. One of the things, too, that you can, you, you can take this to the woodshed and, and pound yourself with it. These super apostles, one thing that they would have all had in common, they would have all had this in common, super huge ego, first of all, because they wouldn't have been self-promoters had they not been. One other thing you can get is if you ever get a groom full of people, in fact, you can just take two, but certainly... Apostles, the super apostles, I don't know how many of them there were, but let's suppose there was three or four. Do you think a man like that or a group of men like that are ever going to get along with each other? No. No. Ultimately, somebody's going to be king of the hill. There'll be an alpha super apostle will finally emerge. Actually, that happened. Um, that's another story, though, what happened to the apostasy of the church with. How, how Pope came to be, but that's another story. So eventually, these guys, they were going to go at it with each other anyway. So there was going to be disorder, there was going to be envy, there was going to be confusion, and there was going to be every evil work. Let's talk about some of these just quickly, and 
the quarreling. Have you ever, and don't misunderstand me, I'm not saying this situation exists here at Berea, but uh, to be forewarned is to be forearmed. Uh, have you ever known a good brother that <laughs> seemed like they wanted to pick a fight about everything? That there was something, to, always something to quarrel about. Dad has an expression, they complain if you hung them with a new rope. Everything, everything has a, <laughs> I never quite understood. He had a lot of crazy things. Yeah. Yeah. Have you heard that in Chris? Well, you're a backwoods guy. Yeah. He always had, I, I would throw things I'd like sometimes at some of our airport meetings. They'd be like, what? They'd look at me, what'd you say? Of course, a lot of these kids are like 25, 30 years old. They didn't know. I told a guy one time, he had come across something, and they were really bragging on it. He really wasn't that bright. And I said, well, even the blind hog finds an acorn every now and then. <laughs> and it just went right over the head, you know. And I just walked out of the room. I'm like, I just insulted him. He didn't even know I did it. But, <laughs> but <laughs> you will run across, and I'm not, and we all take time about, because sometimes opinions are strong, and it's okay, uh, you know, Paul and Barnabas, um, they had a falling out. Uh, when we get over in Galatians a little bit later, we're going to see where Peter confronted Paul about an issue about playing favorites and stuff. So that kind of stuff happens. What he's talking about, though, is just constantly being at odds and being combative just for the sake of doing it. Just to, Because here's what's happening. Here's what happens a lot, y'all. I have seen this at work and a couple times in church. A lot of times people will quarrel as a means of self-promotion. Does that make sense? You know, if something throw, if there's an idea thrown out there, and maybe it's a good idea, but it didn't come from them, then what's the best way to I'm going to shoot it down? I'm going to find something wrong with it. I'm going, I'm going to nitpick it, find something wrong with it, and that will always devolve into a quarrel. There's a quarrel. And the bad thing about quarrels, and we'll talk about the factions here in a minute, when you start the quarreling, it's inevitable because it's just the way people are. It's that tribal mentality. What happens to people? You've got a group of 20 people. There's a quarrel going on. What happens? Yeah, they, you're going to pick sides. Um, uh, for those of you who have been in, unfortunate enough to have endured a divorce, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Families are divided. Friends are divided. You know, people that maybe you went used to run around with as a couple now don't know what to do with you because you're separated and they don't know whether to associate over here or associate over here. It's just, it's terrible. It's terrible. But that's just a formalized quarrel. So, Quarreling is something we need to be. Jealousy, I said before, these guys, and, and even under the, the, the best of circumstances, even under the best of circumstances, um, even when you have uh, players involved like Paul and Peter and Apollos maybe baptizing people, um, is there still a chance of division? Well, of course there was. So, But if you've got people that want to promote division and promote themselves, there's more than a chance. It's a surety. That's exactly what they're going to do. So jealousy will become, well, they'll, that, that'll be part of that amongst themselves and amongst whoever they have following them as a faction. Let me stop here for just a moment. Why do you think there are so many denominations in the world under, under the big overall heading of Christendom? Why are there so many? At some point in time, if you chase the rabbit far enough back in history, what do you think happened to cause that division? There's a lot of things you can place the blame on. Divisions, quarrels, um, false doctrines promoted, but I'm going to tell you, false doctrine, this is just me, false doctrine um, is not the issue. The issue is the promotion of the false doctrine because of your pride and your self-promotion. Because if, if we all submitted to this, there wouldn't be that. Does that make sense? What was the first sin? Devils are our, our, our embodiment of it. Um, but there wasn't a devil when the devil sinned. What was his sin? Pride. Pride was the first one. That was the first one. It wasn't when Cain killed Abel. The first sin was pride. Along with, along with Satan's pride and undermining God's authority, what, what was the ultimate end of that? It was a division. God's going to win, but there was still division, and he's played that same play, he used that same playbook over and over again. Anytime there's um, selfish ambition, 
um, and envy, you're going to have disorder. God is not the author of confusion. He's the author of order. Everything in this universe is orderly. It has to be to hold it together. Just the opposite of that. The negative pole, if, for, for those electricians or electrical engineers in here, the negative side of that is, is the devil. That's, that's it. Now, it, it. This sounds weird, y'all, but, but the devil, he can't even exist without God. You know that? He can't even exist without him. Because God existed without the devil. He, the devil, the only way he can exist is to be the polar opposite of God. It's the only way he can exist. It, it's, but again, another lesson. Let's read a little bit more. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it causes wisdom from above. I know that's your favorite passage. And, and if you see these passages and things that are going on, it's pretty easy. The person doing it may not understand where it's coming from. But you can examine it and know this is either coming from God or somewhere else. But God's not going to put it that way. So over in Ephesians chapter 4, Right. But you can't have oneness unless you have this wisdom from heaven. From above. Because that wisdom from heaven is basically developing an attitude which Jesus had as a man that went to heaven. Pure heart. Peace. No, just the opposite. But we can do that through the spirit living in us. And if we realize, even in our own lives, why am I thinking this way? Why am I getting ready to say this? Examine yourself, self-examination. Why am I doing it? You know, I said before that the, the polar opposites, and then you can go down a long laundry list of, of the good and the evil, the light and darkness, um, the um, the wisdom from above. This is something else you can you can take to the woodshed. If there'll be one of these these three motivators for you: faith, hope, or love, or lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. You remove any one of those, we're all motivated by something, you're exactly right. And that's why I think the examination, when we're supposed to examine ourselves, I think it's something we're supposed to do every day. Whatever we're doing, you're exactly right. But it's, it's against our nature to do that because we want to promote ourselves. and if it looks like it's going to be something good for Lee, I don't want to look at that. You know, I, I don't want to look at that. I don't want to look and see if my motivation is, is something else, if it's covetousness or, or whatever else. I don't want to look at that. So... We end up going down the road, and I don't know. That's what we've been struggling with, I guess, ever since the Garden of Eden. Anger. He talks about anger. It's an extremely dangerous thing. Um, outburst of anger. I'm better than I used to be. I used to be terrible. But I'm better than I used to be. But having an outburst of anger, especially where the Lord's church is concerned, the saints are concerned, it, it, anywhere for that matter, is, um, is a bad thing. Angers, um, there are things that we should be angry about, and that's okay. There is a, there is a place for that. Our Lord, our Lord was angry. But these outbursts of anger shows there's no self-control. As Michael was just saying, that's another thing, a Christian attribute we're supposed to have. The outburst of anger means you, you don't have control of yourself. And the anger that he's mentioned in here, too, has to do with self-promotion. Um, somebody who maybe doesn't agree with your position or, or your opinion on something, you can't get angry about it. You can, well, let me say this. You can, get, you can be angry, you can be upset, but you can't have outbursts and you can't um, be quarrelsome about it. There's a right way and a wrong way about addressing things. And I'm going to tell you all, in our society today, that's all been thrown in the trash bin. There is no civil discourse about anything anymore. You're either for me or against me, and then neither the twain shall meet. And if you disagree with my opinion, I'm going to do my best to slander you and kick you and drag you about town. That's the way, that's, that's all we got. There was a time 
there was a time, and I've heard my grandparents and even my parents speak about, even in religious matters and in political matters, um, there would be times where people would come together and talk and share ideas and stuff. They were able to go back to work and go home and everything was okay. Wow, those days have long since passed, haven't they? But as Christians, we've got to be better than that. We've got to be better than that. And we've got to control our anger. We've got to be people of self-control. And listen, y'all, I struggle with it. I really do. And, and I have, I've been under a, a great deal of burden, um, even in my home life, on, on some things too. And, and people that I love, uh, want to love. Uh, and and it's, it's hard. It's hard to do. Yeah, Kevin. Whether I enjoy. Well, that's and that. Well, and obviously um, manifests itself in in worship services. That's a that's a place where it shows up a lot. Not just on basic tenets on gospel obedience, which is that's that's worse. But um, you're exactly right. I, the, the culture we live in in. And it started a long time ago. The stuff, the, the stuff we're seeing right now, this didn't start last night. Fellow, this started years ago. Um, even when you would go get your, your whopper at Burger King, hold the pickle, hold the lettuce. Best Lord is going to fix All we ask is that you let, let us, you know, that you have it your way. And that's why people see, that's why they see worship anymore, and that's why they see religion. I'm going to find somewhere where what I, whatever fits me, my lifestyle the best, that's, some, that's what I'm going to do. And it's sad, especially if you have people that, people that profess to be Christians, if they're not willing to let the Bible be their standard, then I don't know what their standard is because it's the only one I've got. Uh, if there's another one out there, I'm not aware of it. But it's amazing how many different thoughts and views and opinions you can get that come out of the, the same... <laughs> the same book, and it doesn't matter, it can be the same translation. Listen, y'all, you know, I know there's a lot of folks, and, and I grew up on the King James Version. Do you know which version actually has, has, has been used to promote, <laughs> promote more false doctrine than any other version? The King James Version. Yeah, it's been around longer, and it's, it's done, yeah. So, and it's a great version. It's a great version. What I'm saying is, don't think that... <laughs> One version is going to promote false doctrine because that's just not true. Because anybody, the devil can take um, any version, King James, NIV, I don't care what you use, and can promote, and use it to promote a false doctrine. Um, I can't remember where I heard that the other day. Hmm. My mind is slipping. I'm trying to do a little more reading because when Tucker goes to bed at night, I haven't been able to read a lot. I haven't been able to. So I started doing crossword puzzle stuff. I feel like my mind is just shot, to be honest with you. Because he just requires so much time. And I've got this online, I, I told you all before I used to like playing chess, I got this online chess game, and you play with people all over. Well, I figure I better start out, you know, basic then. So I ended up, I'm playing this little guy, I think he's 15 years old from the UK, and he wore me out. What was so bad about it is he could have probably, you know, beat me like, 20 moves ahead, but he went around and picked off all my pieces. <laughs> kind of like, yeah, 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 anyway. So I got a lot of catching. I got a lot of, got a lot of ground to make up on my chess game. But anger, factions, run out of room. But I do want to talk about factions. This division, uh, this us and they syndrome, 
I think was it was it Buddy Chatfield that said was that Sunday night said he was selling Bibles or something and went to a congregation and the congregation was split but they worshipped in the in the same building and were and sat on two different sides and went out two different doors. That is the most extreme case I believe I've ever heard of. I've never heard anything like that before. Um, yeah, yeah. I think he said his lesson was on unity that morning. You think those people listened? Nope. I don't know how long that had been going on. I asked him who preached. He said, I didn't have a preacher. Well, wonder why. Yeah, oh, I'll, I'll be willing to preach at that two-congregation <laughs> church. Uh, anyway, uh, factions. Uh, wish we had more time. We may talk about these some more next week because it's just, you know. <laughs> that's so sad. That's terrible. God. You know, here's the deal. The devil sits back and he hauls about that. And you know, Jesus looks down and is like, really? Yeah, I, well, I've heard, I've heard stranger, I guess as strange as stuff as that before. But how sad is that? And I, I imagine ultimately, though, if you, if you looked at that further, it was probably going to cost money to lower the ceiling. You had to have people over here to run on the Lord's ceiling now. Yeah, so, and then, so it's always, for those of you who've been here, remember when we built this place? Wow. I steeple these fresh washing, by the way. So all you people have been here all that time, you put that steeple up, you better get the fresh washing. <laughs> no, yeah. No, there was a lot of give and take on a lot of stuff there. I like the steeple. The steeple so looks Gotcha. I agree. So I, I know that, and I had always, you know, if you're building a home, just husbands and wives and families have trouble. But if, you, if you're building a, a, a church thing, it was, um, yeah. I don't know, were you sitting in a, in a meeting we were still over in the old building. We were talking about something. Might have been the steeple. I don't remember what it was. But we had already started and everything. And I was supposed to have been, I was, the building committee chairman there. <laughs> Dad was sitting there next to me. If you were there, you probably mean anyway. I took my head and went. <laughs> and I did it hard. I know. I know that. But that didn't matter, though, because, because there was a faction here that said that the steeple was a symbol of pagan idolatry. You never got to hear everything I got to hear. No. So after I pounded my head and we got out of there and we was in the car and Dad was riding with me and he's so wise, he said, I don't believe you should have done that. <laughs> it's just a part of the building. That's all it is. It, that's all it is. Now, but you got to remember, though, Chris, especially around these parts, if you look at a Church of Christ that was built maybe back in the 50s to the early 70s, they won't have a steeple. They just don't. And that's cool. But if you want one, that's cool, too. But it gets back again. You know, when are you willing to do this? You know, you're going to fall on your sword. That old guy I used to work for, General Moore at the airport, I never will forget it. The old saying, uh, know when to fall on your sword. His amendment was that that's not the important thing. The important thing is to know when to put it back in its scabbard. And I've lived by that. So that wasn't worth it, even though I pounded my head. And Carol wasn't there for that one. Oh, well, there's everybody else. Tim was here. Chris was here. I, I guess Michael was here. He was probably over there. You, yeah, but you was like, you just look. Yeah. Yeah, that was the trap door, trap door baptistry. Yeah, open it up. And we'll quit. We'll start back here next week. I don't want to. We, uh, <laughs> Tim put the thing in, you and, and Stan, the baptistry thing, and it didn't have heat in it. So everybody was, no, you just had to jump. Oh, that was sweet. We had... Well, one Saturday, me and Dad went over here and we put in a, it was a, a little small water heater and a circulating pump to, to warm it. So we closed it back. I set it on like 80, maybe 85. And I thought, well, in the morning, that would be just right. I think Ronnie Gerald was the first one to get here. And the windows in the church were steamed up. 
So <laughs> he, he went down there, and it was it like we stand there preaching. The door was here, and it was like a bifold door. He threw that first door back, and he said, steam come up out of it. He said, you could have cooked lobsters in that thing. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. Was you, I think Don Bradley, I think we had to break some for him. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. It was, but the cave crickets, yeesh. Yeah, that was a <laughs> interesting time. Oh, it was real safe. Yeah. It was a lot of fun. Don't do that. Don't do that. Yeah. Uh, what do you think I was going to put my water heater in with? It was unsafe. Yeah, because I, I I told Ronnie, I said, well, if anybody's baptizing here, we all know I'll turn that breaker off before they get down in there. No, I've got <laughs> water's good. Water is good and warm. Talk about these baptism horror stories next week. Oh, okay. Well, one other thing, too, though, you know, after we put that heater in there, that wood would stay kind of moist. And there was a couple of Sundays you could stand up there and be like, it's real spongy. You're like, at some point in time here, we're going to be. Let's, um, let's have a prayer and. Um, then we'll, we'll dismiss. Would you bow with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the time you've given us, for the day you've given us, for the life you've given us. Help us, dear Lord, to not take each other for granted, to not be so easily quarrelsome, to try to learn from the examples of our Corinthian brothers years ago, whether it be good or bad. Help us to learn. Uh, thank you for Jesus who came and died for us, and it's in his name we offer this prayer. Amen.